Hello and welcome to this introduction to Arduino. In this chapter, I'll provide some examples of how to control servos and DC motors using your Arduino. This is chapter nine in a 10 part series developed for a local hackerspace here in Tucson, Arizona. Some of the examples and screenshots I'll be sharing from this point forward are associated with the manual that comes with the Arduino Ultimate Starter Kit offered by the company Vilrose and are used with permission. Unlike a regular DC motor that doesn't provide any fine control over the position of its axle, servo motors or servos can be commanded to move to a specific position. You'll find servos to control things like robot arms, remote control aircraft surfaces such as rudders, or anywhere something needs to move to a specific position. This is one of my favorite demonstrations by an individual that's developing software to control servos from a PC. This demonstration uses the same kind of servos that come with your standard Arduino kits and are also available on eBay at relatively low cost. For a demonstration of how to control a servo with an Arduino, we're going to reference Sketch 8 associated with the Vilros kit. If you want to follow along with your own Arduino, this slide shows how things are going to be wired up. Here you can see that two of the three servo leads are connected to the power rail on our breadboard, or you could just hook them up directly to the 5 volt and ground socket uh, on the Arduino. And the third is connected to pin 9 on Arduino. Again, I don't go into too much detail about programming in this series, but I will highlight some important elements of the sketch for this demonstration. If you've never seen an Arduino sketch before or don't know what I'm talking about, you might consider reviewing chapters four and five of this series entitled Arduino Integrating Hardware and Software Parts 1 and 2. I'll include links to these videos in the description below. To start with, let's look at this first line of code that reads pound includes servo.h. This line brings in a library that gives us the ability to create objects of type servo in much the same way you might declare a variable of type int for integer, float for decimal, or string for text. Next, we're going to create an object called servo1 of type servo. This object will have access to the various functions defined in the library servo.h, which we included in the first line of our code. Note that we're setting up this object outside of our setup or loop block. By doing so, our servo object may be read or manipulated anywhere else in our program. In our setup block, we're going to indicate that we want our servo1 object to be attached to pin 9 on our Arduino, which mirrors how our circuit is wired up. Since we only have to define this once, our setup block is the perfect place to do this since setup is only run once, right when we power up our Arduino or when we reset it. Now let's get into our loop function, which is where all the real work is done. Here we're using the function write available to servo objects in order to specify what specific position we want an arm attached on the servo axle to turn to. Here you can see we're turning to position 90 or 90 degrees. If we were to attach the servo arm so that it's initially facing towards the right at zero degrees, this line of code would cause it to point straight up. We then write the position to 180, which causes the servo axle to swing a full half circle. And then we bring it back to zero, which brings us back to where we started. Note that between each write, we delay for 1,000 milliseconds, or one second. Next, we use a for loop that will increment the position of the servo arm by two degrees with a delay of 20 milliseconds between each position. The servo arm will swing until it reaches a position of 180 degrees, where it's pointing in exactly the opposite direction from where it started. Finally, we'll use another for loop to swing the servo arm back to its starting position. Once that's done, the loop starts all over again and the whole process repeats. So let's see this sketch in action. Okay, the sketch is loaded up to the Arduino. Um, it's running right now, so when I first plug in this ground pin, it'll probably do something a little crazy, but um, 
eventually it'll fall into the routine that we uh, demonstrated in the PowerPoint presentation. And there it goes. 90, 180, comes back to zero, delays, and then sweeps left and sweeps right as per that for loop. So a pretty simple sketch, but uh, kind of demonstrates the the ease with which you can, you know, control the position of a pointer on a motor or a, or a wheel or anything else. If you're trying this at home and the servo is jittering or acting erratically, it could be that your servo is drawing too much current, which in turn is causing your Arduino to reset. If this is the case, you may have to run it off another power source. In the next few slides, we'll demonstrate how transistors can be used to run higher demand attachments off a different power supply while still controlling them with an Arduino. Two, one. Next, let's talk about DC motors. These are the foundation of many things in our lives, everything from electric car windows, washers and dryers, fans, and even my favorite for scavenging from secondhand shops, small electric toys. Now for the motors that come with the uh, Vilros kits, these require up to 100 milliamps of current. And you may recall from our prior chapters that the Arduino pins are designed to provide no more than 40 milliamps of current for short periods of time. So if we want to control our motor with an Arduino, how do we get around this limitation? Well, you may recall our 5 volt pin can supply up to 400 milliamps of current when the Arduino is powered by a USB cable. So for starters, we'll use the 5 volt pin to power the motor. But wait a minute, how do we control the motor if it's just powered directly off the 5 volt pin? Well, we can control it by using a transistor as a gate for turning power to the motor on and off with the gate being controlled using a digital pin on our Arduino, in this case, pin nine. I'll demonstrate this in detail, but first let's talk a little bit more about transistors. Transistors are small electric switches that allow us to use a small amount of current to open the gate for a larger current supply to pass. In the case of the motor that's attached to our 5 volt pin on the Arduino, the current path for the motor is wired to pass through what's known as the transistor's collector. However, the transistor acts as a gate that doesn't let the current ground. As such, there's no magnetic field generated in the motor's coils, so it doesn't turn. In order for the transistor to allow the 5 volt pin to ground, we need to apply a small amount of current to the transistor's base. That current can be supplied by Arduino pin 9 as we have it wired up in our circuit. Once applied to the base, the transistor allows the current to ground. Once grounded, we'll get current flowing through the motor's coils and the resulting magnetic field induces the motor to turn. But how does this all work in the context of the sketch and the wiring presented in the Vilros kit? Well, let's follow the current to figure it out. We start with the wiring that comes off the 5 volt pin through our motor and the collector on our transistor. At this point, there's no current on the base of the transistor, so the motor circuit is not grounded and the motor has no incentive to turn. Next, let's execute a simple line of code in our sketch that sets pin 9 to high. You'll recall from prior chapters that this is the same as opening a water valve, which induces current flow to the base of our transistor. With the signal to the base, the transistor allows the, the current coming off the 5 volt pin to ground through the motor, which induces current through the motor's coil, a magnetic field in the motor, and thus a turning of the motor's axle. When we close the valve through digital write nine low, we remove the signal to the base of the transistor and the 5 volt pin is no longer grounded. As a result, the magnetic field in the motor collapses, causing the motor to wind down. Since pin 9 is capable of pulse width modulation, we can also use analog write to signal the base of the transistor very rapidly. This gives us the ability to control the speed of the motor programmatically. Further details regarding pulse width modulation are available in chapters four and five of this series entitled Arduino Integrating Hardware and Software Parts 1 and 2. 
With respect to using the analog write function, we have to make sure we don't give it a number that's too small. The reason being that motors require a lot of torque to get started. If we don't give these motors enough power, they may not start at all, similar to what you might encounter physically if you tried to start a bike on an uphill from a dead stop. So if you've followed me through the prior chapters, you know that I'm fairly curious when small components like this diode are included in these commercial starter kits. By now, you also know that I'm a hydrologist and such. I like to compare electrical circuits to engineered water systems. So using water as a metaphor, this little diode is essentially a backflow check valve for electricity. Now, why would we need this backflow valve in our circuit? In order to explain, let's take a closer look at the electrical schematic for this circuit. You can see that the 5-volt pin provides current that passes through our motor but must pass through a transistor before it's grounded. As long as we provide some current off of pin 9, current flows through the motor's coil and the motor turns. But what happens if we turn off pin 9? Well, the circuit through the motor is no longer grounded and the motor slowly comes to a halt. However, while the motor is slowing down, remember that it has coils that are moving within the motor's stationary magnetic field. When this happens, there's charge built up in the motor, and that charge wants to be grounded either through the 5-volt pin on the Arduino or arcing across the transistor. And this can be damaging to your hardware. A flyback diode solves this problem by allowing the inductor or the turning motor to draw current from itself in a continuous loop until the energy is dissipated through losses in the wire rather than by grounding through the Arduino or arcing across the transistor. This puts the circuit back into an uncharged state and ready for its next signal from pin 9. Well, now that we have an understanding of how pin 9 can control the motor, let's go through some of the functions included with sketch 10 of the Vilros kit. You'll notice the loop of the sketch is made up of four functions. The first one is motor on, then off. And here's the function that's called in the loop. You can see that all this function does is turn pin 9, defined as motor pin, on, wait three seconds, and then turn it low. I've wired up a small motor and helicopter prop scavenged from a broken toy. Let's see this function in action. Okay, and this is the setup that I'm gonna use for uh, demonstrating these little DC motors. Of course, you can use these, uh, these little toy motors that come with, uh, you can scavenge out of toys from Goodwill or a pickup online real cheap, but uh, I decided to use this uh, propeller motor on this little DC motor because they don't draw a lot of current and they're just cool for visualizing what's going on. And I pulled that motor out of one of these little helicopters that I picked up from Radio Shack a couple years ago. They were on sale. I think they were five bucks. And uh, my sons played with this one that you see here and uh, didn't last very long. What are you going to do with the broken toy? Of course, take it apart and hook it up to an Arduino and see what you can do with it. So here goes. I'm going to go ahead and upload the uh, sketch with the first function, motor on then off. And let's see what it does. And it's uploading. Turned on. There you go. Pretty much what we expected it to do. Not much to it, really. Let's do something a little more interesting in the next one. The next one is motor on, then off with speed. Let's see how this one works. Here you can see that we're using the analog write capabilities of pin 9 to turn that motor on and off at different speeds. Remember from prior chapters that we can use pulse width modulation to simulate different voltages to the motor by using a scale of 0 to 255 in the analog write function, with 0 being 0 volts and 255 being 5 volts. In this case, we're first simulating a voltage of 3.92 volts, resulting from the use of the number 200 as the argument for the analog write function. We then delay for three seconds before dropping that voltage to 0.98 volts by using the number 50. Let's watch the demonstration. 
Okay, and in this next sketch, um, what we're going to do is turn that motor on then off, but we're going to demonstrate using two different speeds. So let's see how this one works. Um, uploading the sketch right now. You can see the Arduino lights are blinking, saying that the uh, sketch is uploading. There it goes. And you can see that, uh, that that motor is spinning at two different velocities while it's going through that function. It's going fast, then it's going slow, and then it's going fast again. So another pretty easy one. The next one is motor acceleration. Let's see how this one works. Here you can see we're using a for loop to slowly increment the value of the analog write argument from 0 to 255, or 0 to 5 volts. And then we dial it back to a value of 0, or 0 volts, using a second for loop. Now let's see this one in action. Okay, and in this next sketch, we're going to slowly accelerate the motor up to full speed, and then bring it back down to 0. So this one's a little bit more interesting than the last two. Let's see how it works. So we're uploading it. You can see the uh, lights blinking on the Arduino. Let's see what it does. And this one may need a little bit of work because remember what I said about motors uh, requiring a lot of torque when they first get started. And uh, so sometimes we have to give them a little push in the beginning uh, the first time they start up if the threshold is set too low for the pulse width modulation. So right now it's using the stored momentum from the last run to, to keep itself going, accelerate to full speed, turn itself off, but uh, when it turns itself on, it's still got a little bit of momentum from the last loop, so it's good to go. And finally, we have a serial speed function that allows us to enter a pulse width modulation value manually into a serial terminal. And here's the function for that one. Here you can see that we're prompting the user to enter a pulse width modulation value between 0 and 255 via a serial terminal window. We then store that value in the variable speed using the constrain function. What constrain does is simply constrain the user input to a value between 0 and 255 should the user input a value that doesn't make any sense. For example, a value that's greater than 255 which wouldn't make sense for a pulse width modulation value. We then use the entered value to control our motor via pin 9, identified as the argument motor pin in the analog write function. Let's see this one in action. Okay, and so for this last one, uh, we're actually going to use the uh, serial terminal to control the speed of the motor. So I've got my computer monitor showing in the background so you can uh, uh, watch as I input some numbers and see how the motor reacts. So let's go ahead and upload the sketch first. Uploading. And now, here's my serial terminal. And the terminal says type of speed, 0 to 255 in the box above, and then plus press return. So, I don't know, let's type something like, well, let's type 255 to see this thing going full speed. And there we go. And now it's waiting for another speed. So let's go half speed. Let's go, I don't know, let's call it 125. So this one, of course, isn't going quite as fast. Let's see what happens if I type 100. And now let's give it a really no, low number, something like 50, and see what happens. And you can see it just doesn't have enough torque to get itself going. If I give it a little spin, not even then. So the lower threshold is something above 50. Let's try something like 75, see what happens this time. This time it's just barely, barely spinning. So that gives you an idea of how we can control the motor speed using a serial terminal and pulse width modulation.
course, you can take sensor data and in the same way store it in a variable that's read by uh, analog read. Uh, not only the speed, you can also control the, the direction of your motor. So that's where it gets interesting with respect to robotics and sensing the environment around you and having your robot respond accordingly. Pretty cool stuff. So in closing, motors provide a relatively easy way to integrate your Arduinos with movement in the real world, and thus open up yet another dimension for your inventions. In the next video, I'll go over stepper motors, which are similar to servos in that they give you a way to precisely control movement. Subscribe for updates, and thanks again for watching.